We are not fortune tellers. I, I can't really predict anything, and I always make the wrong prediction. Uh, these are my personal declaration of interest. Like uh, four years ago, I, I bought a property in Portugal uh, for the EU identity. At that time, we never predicted Brexit, and the intention was for my daughter to have a, a British identity to study there, and then everything comes as a surprise. So we have our second plan. A few months ago, I bought a property in Britain. At that time, I never predicted hard Brexit, and at the end, things changed. So, so we cannot predict the future, really. But at the same time, we can have some macro trend observation. And uh, in our research, we always study the internet responses, the big data, and how we can use the big data to map the future. And for that reason, I am very pessimistic about the future. I think the worst is yet to come. Uh, things have just begun, not only in UK, but also the US, Hong Kong, everywhere else in the world. Because we're entering into a totally brand new order. So to start with, what's the origin of Brexit, besides the things that we all knew? I see there are a lot of common features behind all these Trump, Brexit, Japan, AFD in Germany, uh, Modi of India, and the localists in Hong Kong, like the demonstration last week. And they have some kind of interaction. For, in for instance, Donald Trump is being regarded as the hero by the localists in Hong Kong. The kids on the street, they always said, okay, now we're leaving everything to Trump. Only this guy can save us. So you will be surprised by the fact that Donald Trump is the internet hero in India, in Hong Kong, and to some extent even in mainland China. So what's the rationale behind? It seems to me that there's a globalized network. And this network is facilitated heavily by the internet. Right now, the world is, broadly speaking, defined between the so-called winners and losers of globalization. The free flow of capital, migration, skill sets, everything has enabled people like us to be the winners. And some people identify themselves as the losers. And that's not the problem. The problem is that the definition of winners and losers are more perceptive than materialistic. For instance, a lot of Trump supporters, they're actually very rich. They are actually leaders, the old elites. But they identify themselves as a loser. So this is the kind of perceptive politics that we are studying. So who are the real losers is not important. The point is that a lot of people in this world, they would like to see changes. As a result, the elites are always the minority in the society. And the new leaders like Trump and Boris Johnson, they like to be positioned as an anti-elitist, non-mainstream leaders, even though they're absolutely trained by the elitist education. And, and then, as another result, we see the identity politics reconstructed. A lot of people, by making use of the internet, reconstructed their own identity, and they wish to challenge the mainstream. And this is the macro background of this whole thing. What's worried us further is the uh, impact of so-called algorithm, algorithmic, algorithmic, it's very difficult to pronounce, algorithmic <laughs> politics. So this algorithm thing is, is very tricky. Like when we're using Facebook, I'm a so-called key opinion leader in Hong Kong. When we're using the Facebook, we're always being guided by the algorithm. We don't really have the choice. So you can either stick with the algo or you will be hidden by everyone. So this is the dichotomization that we are living in. The young latizens are heavily influenced by the algo. And right now, the old latizens our parents, our grandparents, they're also being heavily influenced by that. Which means the world is being polarized. This is an example here. In the United States, 10 years ago, we see the entire political spectrum being dominated by the mainstream. But right now, it's extremely polarized. In the past, we respect the people situating in the middle. But right now, most politicians, they would like to stick with one side. So this is a structural change, and I see no solutions for the future to be different. These uh, alternative viewpoints are being empowered by the internet. We see a lot of alternative movements online, and they are politically incorrect, but they are increasingly popular. So let me quote an example here. In the United States, one of the most popular websites, so-called media, is called InfoWars. It's an absolute fake news-oriented conspiracy theory hub that they have 10 million circulation uh, hit rates per month. It's better than CNN, New York Times, whatever. 
So they have made a lot of impacts in the election. They have absolutely no credibility, but they're able to swing the voters. During the Brexit campaign, we saw similar events happening in Europe. A lot of websites, online media, rumors circulating around. They are not credible, but they are actually influencing and swinging the voters. For the internet generation, the real world is not real, and the virtual world is not virtual. This is my prediction. As a result, Britain is a victim. Of course, um, the entire impact would be relevant to everywhere in the world, but Britain is a particular victim because the original political system in Britain is designed for the typical elites. So what are the rationales behind the latest politics in the UK? For instance, they encourage the mainstream politicians to be the leaders. They marginalize the extreme parties, and that's the first path to post, first path to post political voting system. But right now, the entire system has been challenged. The entire referendum is extremely problematic. Cameron is very irresponsible in terms of organizing the whole thing without having any actual plan. So what's the ground of that referendum? It's based on an act passed in the year of 2000, political parties, elections, and referendum acts. But strictly speaking, the referendums are only consultative in nature, which means according to the dogmatic understanding. In the UK, it's still ruled by the parliament, the sovereign was in the parliament, and this is only referencing the public opinions. However, Cameron had made a statement that he has to respect that decision, but he hasn't specified any details. Usually a referendum elsewhere in the world, in France or Switzerland, anywhere else, that would be very complicated. A threshold, um, a firewall, a safety net, a lot of things to make things pass. But in the UK, we have none of that. So what's happened last time was that it's a simple majority vote, no second chance, full of fake news, no mechanism to guarantee that the information being circulated are accurate. This is very problematic. If that's a second referendum, I'm sure a lot of things has to be addressed, but no such mechanism. So this is, in my opinion, a very irresponsible behavior to make changes without a full plan. So damage has been done. What are the future? What makes things worse is that even though from the financial point of view, I think probably it's not a wise choice for the UK to offer that, but from the international point of view, a lot of countries have the vested interest to push forward the Brexit idea. For instance, we see a global support of this so-called alternative rights movement. In the United States, in Europe, a lot of people sharing similar ideology, they're actually working together to create a momentum, especially on the internet. The former uh, strategist of Trump, Mr. Bannon, he has actually set up an office in Europe to support the right-wing parties over Europe. The ultimate goal, according to him, is to destroy the EU. And he is not alone. A lot of people, maybe they're speculating the interest, maybe they're for various ideological reasons, they are trying to work in this, uh, as an alliance. We also have the, the Russian impacts, a lot of uh, suspected Russian involvement on the internet. They would be more interested in weakening the EU and to have the role of London uh, as the safe haven of the anti-Putin dissidents being changed. We see a potential plan of the Canadian, Australian, New Zealand international proposal that is supposed to be proceeded after the eventual completion of Brexit to rebuild a commonwealth wise oriented. We also have plans from India, even though the official stance of India was not to support Brexit, but according to, the, to a lot of uh, Indian analysis, they also prefer to have this happening because they would win something as a result. So uh, we also see a potential outcome of separatism if Brexit is confirmed. A second referendum in Scotland is highly likely and probably that will result in the dissolution of the United Kingdom. So a lot of people, in short, have the incentive to see this tragedy to be proceeded. So how about China? This is my personal research. 
Officially speaking, China would like to engage the UK, and they have made a lot of efforts to engage the UK in these complicated moments during the Sino-US trade war. So China, a weakened, polarized, the surviving EU is working to the best advantage of the Chinese interest. China had made successful engagement with Hungary, Greece, Italy, etc., and they somehow represent some kind of interest within the EU. So if Britain can join the path that is working to the Chinese advantage. According to uh, the UN Conference on Trade and Development, the Chinese export to the UK would be increased by 10 billion US dollars if Brexit is confirmed. They even predicted that China would be the greatest winner if the whole plan is proceeding, following by the United States, United States and Japan. According to the official ideology, the Belt and Road need the British support. And according to publicized information, uh, Britain is still making a relatively neutral stance in the Huawei controversy. They would like to situate between the United States and China in this regard. So uh, from the Chinese perspective, they are expecting this to happen, and they have made preparation for that to happen. And they also expected the UK to be more vocal in terms of human rights, democracy, liberty, Hong Kong issues, etc. Because that is understandable. That is the exchange for the Chinese interest to be gained from Brexit. As a result, it seems almost right now certain that a kind of hard Brexit would happen. We are still looking for the next prime minister, but I, I don't think there are real differences. Uh, suppose Ni Jeremy Hunt is more s s is softer, but in reality, I don't think he really has an option. What's worry us, as the traditional so-called elites, is that no matter who is the next prime minister, the British system seems to be destroyed forever. Things will be changed. So these are the, the updated quotes from Britain. First of all, a lot of conservative members, new members, are actually the members of the newly formed Brexit party by Nigel Farage. So they do have a voice. They do have the ability to swing the final outcome. And secondly, according to the latest poll, the Conservatives and the Labour, they are very unpopular. They only rank the third and the fourth. So right now, according to that poll, you go. The Lib Dems are the most popular party, followed by, to our surprise, the Brexit party, formed by Nigel Farage. So this is a very, very different situation that we're facing. All the traditional mainstream parties are losing credibility, and the people are opting for something that they are absolutely having no doubt ideas about. So these two figures are particularly alarming. So let's look at the left-hand one. 46% of the Tory members would be happy if Nigel Farage became the leader of their party. That is unprecedented. So um, the former UK IP, they are always being considered as a non-mainstream radical party, but right now they are gradually walking to the middle. And the right-hand side is even more irrational, seemingly. A lot of Tory voters, they would rather to have the UK being destroyed. So when they're being asked if Scotland is leaving the United Kingdom, if there's significant damage to the UK economy, etc., they would still opt for hard Brexit. So what's the rationale here? As I've explained at the beginning, it is illogical from the financial sense, but from the perceptive point of view, it's totally logical because they identify themselves as a loser. This logic, according to Hong Kong idiom, is called the scorched earth tactic, right? Right now, the kids on the streets, they always quote this word. They wish to create a scorched earth in Hong Kong, and then things can be restarted. So this kind of logic is beyond elitist understanding in the traditional sense, but it's very popular online. Otherwise, we won't be able to observe these kind of public opinions. And these are the most updated figures. So what's the outcome? Let's have time, right? Two yes, minutes? Sir. Two minutes. Okay. So these are my personal prediction. Again, I, I always made a wrong prediction, but according to theories, these are the logical outcome. EU would be the loser, but uh, a lot of um, potential replacement can be made. China, Japan, India, some of the Commonwealth countries, they would like to replace some of the original roles played by the EU in terms of financial and trade. The dissolution of the United Kingdom is definitely possible, and that could be disastrous. 
if there's a second referendum in Scotland, I, I can't see any reasons that it cannot be passed. And that could be followed by other places. Well, we don't know. However, in order to maintain its importance, Britain would try to play a critical role in the new world. Right now, we're entering into the new Cold War, and Britain would like to play a role between the Chinese and the Americans. And that's how they position themselves in the Huawei controversy. They would like to use the technology without offending the United States, and that's the possible direction of future foreign policy. The EU would be weakened, but I don't think that would collapse. But there are a lot of uncertainties. First, what's the propaganda of the Brexit come in the coming years? Right now, the greatest uncertainty is that would there be a real negative impact in the UK economy in the short run? If that can be seen, probably the other countries in the EU will have a hesitation. But I, I don't think the impact will be too short-term oriented. It's a long-term process. Probably in the next few years, we can't see the real damage. As a result, the right-wing parties, the alternative parties in the EU, they would be encouraged and they would pose hey, you see, after Brexit, Britain is still doing OK, then why we still need the EU? I think that would be in the mainstream discourse on the internet in these countries. So the second uncertainty is that whether there are new refugee crises in the EU. And it depends on the war. Syria has the civil war being ended, but it's, it's not impossible to have a new war like Iran or other places. So if there are another round of refugee crisis, the anti-EU propaganda would be very strong. So we would like we would also like to see the performance of the mainstream parties and the elites in Germany and France to see whether the EU is sustainable. So if all these answers are positive, EU can sustain. Otherwise, there will be a deep crisis. And my investment will be in great trouble. So this is um, not my wishful thinking. But anyway, within the EU, it's been divided already. German, Franco alliance and the alternative Hungarian model, so to speak. And this is a very interesting observation. Hungary has played a very interesting role in the EU. They promote a very different EDRG, and they're collaborating with China. So I think no matter whether you sustain or not, we see two models, two paths, two alternatives either way. So if the financial impacts in the next few years are containable, a global right-wing movement would definitely be encouraged, even in Hong Kong. Again, if we study the discourse of the Hong Kong protesters, they always quote a few cases. Donald Trump, the hero, Brexit, making an impossible mission possible, and similar things. So I think it will be a huge boost of the morale around the world for this movement. And finally, this is my final point. The new Cold War seems inevitable. It's not the same as the old Cold War because the world has been interdependent for so long. But we see the rise of protectionism, and that is also a guiding principle of these Brexit exercise. So this seems to be comparable to the interwar period. We're entering into a totally new era. Globalization will be attacked from different fronts, and Brexit is only the beginning, and that's my pessimistic personal analysis. Thank you so much. Thank you. Of Brexit, um, I would like to highlight that potentially the reason why we've seen a lot of support for um, extreme uh, rightist or separatist movements is the fact that the global environment has been so supportive. So a lot of people have not yet felt the full impact um, of, of, the, of the black swan scenarios like Brexit and the election of Trump. Trump is arguably capitalizing on a wave uh, that was started by the Obama administration. And by the way, Trump did not come up with protectionism. The Obama administration implemented a lot more protectionist measures than Trump. It's just that they use more advanced measures than tariffs. Tariffs are something out of the 60s that Trump can sort of use at a whim, and they make a lot of noise. But the Obama administration was by no means liberal in, in that sense. Like, it, it's something that's been happening for many years. Um, but, but the global environment has been very supportive. Um, in particular, in 2017 and 2018, we've seen a lot of growth from emerging markets and advanced markets and the Eurozone. And that's helped to shield the, the negative impact that Brexit has had on the UK economy. Going forwards, of course, as you'll see um, in 2019, we do expect that to come down slightly. So um, we have a reversal of conditions. So you have downside pressure stemming from Brexit, and you also have a slowing world 
um, and a slowing gl global trade and, and, and global economy. So it will magnify the negative impact of Brexit and potentially that might lead to a shift in perceptions uh, that, pr that Professor Shen was discussing in his presentation. But this is a big question mark and I leave that to the political, political scientists. Um, there have been negative impacts on the economy yet, but not on GDP. GDP, we still expect it to grow by 1%. But on the exchange rate front, you do, you do see, of course, a very direct impact from Brexit. Um, and that is translated into higher imported inflation. So UK consumers have felt a negative impact in the sense that everything is more expensive over there. Also on consumer sentiment, in particular um, business, um, sorry, consumer sentiment in particular as a reflection of that high um, inflation has been um, very negative uh, since uh, the Bre Bre Brexit vote in 2017. And that is of course not gonna help um, households in terms of investment um, or consumption going forward. Um, in 2017, we saw a slight decline in investment, but that became a lot more visible in 2018 with that minus 1.3% um, decline. And we do expect to see a, even, an even bigger decline in investment. And investment does weigh a fair bit in the UK economy, so that is going to translate into some pressures on the growth front. Um, moreover, in, in correlating with that uh, weaker uh, sentiment on the consumer front, we do see a larger number of companies um, saying that um, in case of a no deal or, in, or, or as a result of Brexit, they are planning to move their operation out of um, the UK and into other, other parts. So we have a 29% uh, considering relocation or have activated relocation plans or are planning to activate relocation plans. So that, that does not bode well for investment going forward. If you have 30% or a third of companies that are planning to leave, leave the country, it's not going to um, translate nicely into investment figures going forwards. Something else that we monitor closely at COFAS is insolvencies. So of course we worried about um, bankruptcies and insolvencies because that's when we lose money. And we did see finally an uptick in the number of insolvency cases in the UK and we do expect this to increase as well in 2019. So overall there was a 10% increase in the number of insolvencies in the UK, which the down the line as, as the months go by, go by has implications on the overall economy as well. And we see a lot of these insolvencies taking place in the services industry, but also in construction and um, in, in the retail trade industry as well. Of course, as consumers cons um, just don't shop as much because they're worried about the future implications of the political transitions there. So we do see some negative impact on the economy. All of these impacts are expected to ma become magnified as uh, sort of growth in other parts of the world slow in this year. So what's next? Um, we didn't touch too much upon the different scenarios in the previous presentation, I guess because the situation is very fluid at the moment. Um, currently with um, you know, Theresa May stepping down as a prime minister, we do see a significant uptick in the likelihood of a no deal scenario taking place. That would be like the first, the first possible route that things uh, can, can, the turn of events that things could take. The second of course is um, some form of deal coming through. This was most likely when Theresa May was still prime minister. Um, and the deadline can potentially be extended. So there are different sort of um, shapes that I could take. It could be another trade agreement. It could be a customs union, a common market 2.0. Uh, but again, very fluid and a lot of uncertainty on that front. And the third scenario is, of course, that say something happens. They try to push a hard Brexit scenario. There's uh, labor pushes for um, a no confidence vote. The prime minister has to step down. And then you have another election. Um, so that's another scenario, a general election and potentially a second referendum. But as we go through the three scenarios, you'll see that this is almost a Pandora box and you, it's very, the outcome is highly uncertain. So um, it's unlikely that this would be the preferred, the preferred um, outcome. So going on to the first scenario, which has become a lot more um, likely now with, um, John, uh, yep, sorry, with Johnson heading the, the polls. Yeah, so he does have 36% of support in government, although of course there's been a series of events over the weekend, I don't know if you've been following the news, but uh, apparently he had police in his apartment because they were not behaving very well. <laughs> um, that could... <laughs> uh, I surprised you don't have more questions on that given the timing and this event, but um, yes, it is possible that he will lose support in, in the party and they're still doing voting rounds. Uh, um, and it, it's possible that as a result, we might have Jeremy Hunt. Now, Jeremy Hunt was pro-Remain at the beginning, and then 
he, he became a pro-Brexiter as a result of what he says was arrogance on the, on the behalf of the European Commission in dealing with the U UK. But of course, if he does become the next Prime Minister, it is possible that he could you know, default back to his pro-Remain stance, or it would definitely be a more uh, nuanced approach than Boris Johnson's approach. His sort of winning card right now is that he's pushing for a deal, uh, for a Brexit scenario, whether they have a deal or not. So if he does become the next Prime Minister, it's quite likely that by Halloween, the UK will be out, even if it involves a no-deal scenario. And the impact of a no-deal scenario is large, um, potentially even a small recession in the UK. Um, we look at sectors as well, and I think that's interesting for our clients to understand sort of who is going to be affected the most. Um, here we have the agri-food sector with um, average tariff levels of 26% for non-EU agricultural companies that export to the EU, and 70% of UK's agri-food trade is, is EU-based, so that's going to be a big impact there. Automotive, because that supply chain is heavily uh, globalized and a lot of the upstream suppliers are based in Eastern Europe. Uh, construction, of course, we've already seen a big uh, decline in investment there and that could be magnified as a result of uncertainty surrounding a no trade deal. Uh, retail, where we've seen a decline in consumption as well, we, it doesn't bode well for that sector. Pharmaceuticals, um, again, this is a sector which is very dependent on standards set by uh, bodies that are based in out of Brussels, so you'd have to reinvent the wheel for them. Uh, and two-thirds of medicines used in the UK are imported from the EU, so th those will become more expensive. Um, and the chemical sector, where 75% of U UK chemical imports come from the EU. So uh, overall, the impact of scenario one is not going to be a pretty one. And I haven't mentioned, but I me I'll mention it in the next slide, the impact, of course, on financial services as uh, a lot of the banks uh, do lose their, their financial passport rights in the UK and, and have to relocate. Um, and insurance companies, by the way. So this also has a direct impact for companies such as COFAS, where we'd have to maneuver around the legal implications of you know, not having access to, to the EU from the UK. Scenario two is, again, a deal and a transition, which could potentially be increased up to 2020. Highly fluid, lots of different potential scenarios, as you'll see here. Um, and eventually, you'd hit a backstop um, where, you, where you would be like a no-deal scenario. Um, Difficult to gauge what the, a potential deal would look like, but um, it's highly unlikely that a potential deal would include uh, the financial passport, so that's off the table. Um, in any scenario other than, you know, you vote to, to abolish the, um, the Brexit deal. Um, and of course, some tariffs would have to be imposed. It's not likely that they'll have the same sort of status as they currently have. Um, if they negotiate to leave the, the EU single market. So, but this will definitely be more muted than a no Brexit scenario. And the third scenario is a general election and second referendum, which is a Pandora box. The poll, polling results that you'll see on the chart on the left are slightly different, but they're also older, they're from March. Um, the things have changed quite significantly, but it's it just, just comparing the two presentations, you can see how volatile the situation is in terms of where the support is for which party. Um, and of course, um, the, the, the chart on the right is also from March, but you'll see um, support for Brexit is still fairly high with 45% uh, of respondents saying that they would vote for Brexit again. So in case you do have a second referendum and people vote to, to leave the EU, then the case for a no Brexit deal would be even stronger or reinforced. So I, 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 it's likely that um, MPs will avoid this third scenario because it has the potential to be very disruptive um, unless Boris Johnson is elected unless he pushes for a no deal um, scenario and unless um, Parliament can't stop it, but they can start a no confidence vote, in which case they would, they would um, initiate a general election process. So that's, th those are the preconditions that would be needed for scenario three to take place. But again, this is, this, is a, this is a big question mark and no one knows the outcome. In terms of the impact on Asia, um, we look at, the trade channel first, because that is the biggest impact. Um, a lot of times people like to quote the, the biggest exporting countries, and of course China, Japan, and India had uh, that list with almost 9% of the UK's total um, imports coming from China. Uh, but as we'll see in the second slide, um, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Also, just a note of caution, when we look at direct exports to a country, we're not factoring in the fact that there's um, supply chain disruption, so maybe you are exporting to another country, uh, say you are Malaysia exporting to China, um, but of course the ultimate demand for those products is in the UK. And so it doesn't, if you just look at trade figures, it doesn't reflect that, but you would see a decline in demand from China 
as a result of this, um, as, as, as a result of a slowdown in the UK, just because there wouldn't be as much demand for Chinese, Chinese goods there, um, and Malaysia would be hit, even though it doesn't appear on this list. Um, the chart on the right, you'll see the top exports of the top exporters to the UK. Uh, so the, it gives you an idea of the sort of goods and the sort of companies that will feel the squeeze um, of a no Brexit deal, of a decline in, in UK activity the most. And it's not surprised that we see electronics, machinery, apparel and footwear, a big sector. Um, auto parts, again, a supply chain that's highly globalized, furniture and toys. So these are the companies that will um, experience um, the, a decline in, in, in exports from the UK the most. But there's an indirect aspect of this, which is if in case there's a no, um, a, a no deal uh, scenario, the UK administration will be very, very busy negotiating an, some form of solution or deal with the EU. They might not have time for a significant number of months to actually deal with Cambodia or Vietnam or actually find, figure out another tariff agreement with a lot of these countries. Because currently, the EU tariffs apply. If the UK leaves, they have to decide what tariff level they apply on, on imports from Vietnam, China and the like. And it might not take place right away because they might be more busy with um, the EU in the short term. So there might be an interim period of uh, six months where you cannot export anything to the UK if you are um, a Vietnamese uh, apparel exporter. So that potentially impact could be much higher. But of course, uh, we never like to talk just about um, trade. We, are, we need to contextualize it in terms of the size of the different economies. And it actually shows a very, very different picture to what you see here. So here you see China as a country that will feel the impact the most. But in terms of um, exports to the UK as a percentage of GDP, China does not um, head the list. In fact, it's not even top 10. Um, Vietnam uh, accounts, f its GDP is more dependent on exports to the UK than any other country in Asia. And Hong Kong, interestingly, comes second. Of course, Hong Kong plays a very important role as a trading hub between China and the world. Um, and the UK is, is a relatively large uh, market for Hong Kong um, as well. So definitely, you will have a lot of traders in Hong Kong um, that will feel um, a, a decline in, in, in orders from the UK if, if things do take a turn for the worse there. And as an, impact, as, an o as an impact relative to the overall size of the economy, it will be fairly large. It will be about 1.8%. So definitely, uh, we are currently, when we look at Brexit, we are evaluating not so much the risks on India or China. Uh, some, some analysts have even pointed out that these countries stand to benefit from, from uh, divorce between the UK and, and, the EU, and the EU, although I, I'm a little bit cautious about saying that just because overall I think it's, it's not worth it. But anyway, there's, there are voices that are arguing that. Um, we are focusing on Vietnam, Hong Kong, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. Uh, these are the countries that will be impacted the most, in particular if you are an apparel exporter to the UK, um, or an electronics or um, a toy exporter to the UK, a toy being a big, big sector for Hong Kong as well. So those are the countries that will struggle the most. And just to finish off um, my presentation, Hong this is just the impact of trade. Of course, in Hong Kong, you have very large financial institutions that also have a very strong presence in the UK, and their operations there will be impacted. And a lot of these financial in institutions, I believe, have also been toying or considering alternative plans in case there's a, there a hard Brexit, there's a no-deal Brexit scenario. And, that, and if they do relocate their headquarters to other parts of the world, that would also have a very negative um, impact on, on the UK, but also on, on the activity and the business um, activity of these companies. So potentially that impact for Hong Kong will be magnified if you factor in um, all of the service exports that Hong Kong does to the UK that are not captured in this chart. Um, that's it from me. Thanks so much. Before opening the floor for questions, maybe I have one myself first. And um, uh, maybe a little bit positive um, among all the gloomy stories. And uh, I already benefit from the uh, Brexit because my oldest daughter is going uh, to London to study after this summer. So the pound is historical low. <laughs> and uh, so there are even predictions that saying that, you know, uh, the pound sterling might even go to the level of um, uh, the euro or maybe even the, the US dollar. Uh, we have been talking about the trade, but, but how about investment? Uh, maybe I, I start with Carlos first, maybe to answer this question. What do you expect from there? I mean, is, the, is that a good opportunity to invest maybe uh, in, in U UK? In real estate? We were discussing uh, well, this well, I, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> um, so I do, um, we currently consider uh, pound euro parity as a very likely 
uh, outcome. Likely. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, in the case that there's a hard Brexit, definitely that would trigger like a, a heavier depreciating cycle for the pound. Okay. Um, and that might make certain types of investments attractive, mm -hmm. um, especially if you are exposed to the US dollar or you're in Hong Kong and, and you're not subject to depreciatory pressures as, as much as potentially you would be if you're in the UK. Um, it, it does pose a question of where you think the UK will go in, in the very long term. Yeah, so right. maybe um, if there's a uh, hard Brexit, it's not the potentially not the right time. But um, if we enter like that op scenario too, where you have like, uh, you know, an administration that is trying to, to promote a, a deal, so like a civilized divorce from the EU, then of course, you know, some tariffs will be applied, there'll be some volatility in the short term, but the impact will be much smaller in the, in the medium to long term. And, that, and then potentially there's um, some scope for some bargain hunting in, in the UK. But uh, again, very fluid. It's very hard to say at this point. Oh, maybe come, uh, coming back to Simon's um, uh, um, fortune telling about the breakdown of, of UK, maybe we have to buy it in Scotland, assuming that Scotland will, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but um, please, any questions? From Andrew, please. Thank you. Uh, I'll try to keep this concise. So many questions one could, of course, ask. Uh, I have to admit also I'm quite literally party pre on the Brexit issue, so I'll try and be neutral as well. I'd like to get the speakers, very good speakers, comments, if I may, on three points that they made. Uh, it, it, more comments. The first is both were making it not as gloomy, but l like a lot of the coverage, it seems to me very exaggerated, the effect. Um, and I think that is it not, would it not be fair to say that for someone like myself who remembers the Vietnam War, the Korean War, the Cold War, the, the, the Cultural Revolution in China, that this is the Cuban Missile Crisis, this is actually pretty tame stuff. And to, to talk about as, as though it's the end of this present world as we know it might be for the young people who haven't experienced this before. So that's one, the long-termism part. Uh, a second thing is the comparison, making the comparison between Brexit or, and specifically uh, Boris Johnson and the po so-called populist movement of Mr. Trump. Now, I'd like Simon in particular to, to, to maybe clarify this because uh, to me, um, Trump and Boris are opposites, even though Trump may endorse him. Um, the people who will put Boris into power if they do the 160,000 members of our, our political party, um, quite a high proportion of them can't use the internet. There is no way in which this is a populist. Um, he's a one nation Tory. Look at his record in London. So uh, perhaps it's not the same sort of internet function that stirs up students here or, or, or wherever you want to say in, in France, the Gilets Jaunes or whatever. So that's the second one. And finally, um, if we're to, um, look at some of the slightly negative figures, uh, like on investment, for example. The response that I get from, not from the, from the hoi polloi, but from sort of top business folk in UK who support Brexit, supported it, um, is that this is actually also pretty mild. Uh, if it had been as bad as people were saying it was going to be, you'd see a lot more than a little bit of fall off in the, in the, in the property market or in, in foreign in investment. And to the extent that we are seeing negative equity, uh, sorry, negative factors, they don't blame the Brexit thing. They blame the bad way in which it's been handled by May. And secondly, they blame the fear, which is tangible, of Jeremy Corbyn being the next substantive ruler of, of the country. Uh, that, to me, accounts for a lot of the financial negatives. But so those are three points. Sorry, I was a bit long-winded long than I intended to be, but if you have comments on all or any of them, I'd be very interested. Thank you. Can we start with the economics? I'll leave the sure. ones to you. <laughs> so on, on the economic point, um, first of all, to clarify that that drop in investment is not foreign investment. It um, includes foreign and domestic investment. Um, and so, so yes, um, you know, media is media and they, they have to make headlines. So some of the coverage has been exaggerated. I think it's, there's an important question of opportunity cost. So had Brexit not taken place, where would the UK be now uh, compared to where it is? Um, as we've see, seen, the external environment has been supportive. So I do think that the, the GDP figures, the sort of macro indicators are going to start edging down a little bit more 
quickly uh, going forwards and potentially that will um, also change the perception of a lot of people that voted pro Brexit in terms of how we didn't expect this was going to be so so large but but yes the reality is that GDP is still growing at 1% so it's not uh, like it growth fell off a cliff the main problem is uncertainty and that's also one of the main factors that's dragging on investment um, so the faster that they can figure out a plan of course everyone wants at this point because you don't know what will happen in case of a second referendum if you can at least push for a civilized divorce um, where there's less uncertainty for businesses uh, everyone has contingency plans they know how much it's going to cost and then they can plan accordingly um, the impact on the overall economy will be much lower than you know if you have a no brexit deal and in in october suddenly um, you, everyone has to figure things out overnight um, just i was doing a similar speech um, on a different topic Bre brexit came up um, in in france and we had industry representatives and one of the gentleman in the room was from a very large company that manufactures soft drinks. Um, and they mentioned that they've been told by the government that they have to increase inventories just in case, this was right before the, the previous deadline, in case of a no Brexit deal, you, you need to have enough soda in, in your, on your shelves to sort of like help you to survive through the sort of few weeks of uncertainty, a few months of uncertainty. The problem is you can't just build a new, a new like st st storage facility overnight. Um, so even if you max up your existing capacity, like there will still be shortages of certain products on the shelves of the UK. So I think it's more like this uncertainty and this risk of there being a hard Brexit that is what is worrying investors. If it's managed well, I think that the overall implication on the economy will be lesser. But could the UK be even better in the absence of all of this uh, uncertainty and this divorce? That is, a, that is a question. It's not so much that the UK is going to stop being relevant or is it going to, growth is going to fall off a cliff. Uh, impact will be higher in case of a hard Brexit. It's not. It's potentially manageable, but the UK could have potentially grown much faster in, if none of this had happened in the first place. That's the, the big question mark. Okay, uh, thank you. Is it exaggerating the impact? Uh, as a political scientist, I think it's very difficult to, to apologize different, different factors um, because we have a uh, economic factors, political factors, cultural factors, everything. Uh, the fact is that the economy is doing so well, so we can't really tell what's the actual impact of Brexit, and that's the biggest problem. A lot of people assume that it's going okay because they can't taste the difference. Mm -hmm. Probably the actual impact will only come after a few years, so that's, that's the thing we can't tell. Um, similarities between Trump and Johnson, well, besides the hairstyle, I do think there are <laughs> 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 quite a few things. <laughs> uh, the similarity is that first they emphasize on the identity politics, which is something that is a little bit alarming to me. To make America great again or to rebuild the Greek, Tory or British tradition. These kind of things are a lot and tiny rational, but they are very appealing to um, a lot of internet population in particular. Even though there are differences, a lot of old people uh, support Brexit as well, but um, that's the first thing. And secondly, they are actually challenging the traditional elitist vested interest. Uh, in the United States, it's very paradoxical. Trump himself is definitely a vested interest holder. He comes from a very rich family and all that, but he always claimed to be an outsider. And then, as a result, he can engage a new paradigm. Uh, a similar thing, as I also is happening uh, in the UK. Johnson is definitely an elitist, but he tried to be a so-called ordinary individual and he tried to build a new support base. And third, they don't trust globalization and that's another thing that is also alerting. Uh, you may consider... Yeah, because technically Trump said the same thing. He didn't say, I, I will withdraw from the world. He only positioning himself as someone to re redraw the map, to redefine globalization, redraw the map of the rules of globalization, these kind of things. But in reality, the actual impact is to have a great richness over this world order. Uh, 
as we have witnessed from the campaign of Brexit, full of so-called fake news, misinformation. That is accusing the EU for different things. But uh, anyway, that's my personal opinion only. And uh, uh, finally, against my personal opinion, they are quite relying on the post-truth, post-modern politics. When they are talking about the facts and data, it's not entirely reflecting an objective fact. And that is in line with the internet generation. Uh, as we know, there's a court case against Johnson. I don't know. I don't think that will be anything relevant. But uh, in fact, there are people arguing that maybe some kind of information has been swaying the results and that's the typical feature of this kind of uh, slightly populist politicians. C Cameron, Cameron. Court case against Cameron. You said. I have a quick general question. This is probably more related to economics, so I have addressed to Mr. Casanova. Yes. I read your, if I read your numbers correctly, the 75 percent, up to 70 percent of medicines from imported from Europe into UK, and substantial amount of chemicals products imported from U Europe to UK, and basically the supply chain of automobiles is basically a UK and Europe is interlinked, one reflection the other. So if UK doesn't stay in the status quo, say go for a hard Brexit, mm -hmm. because I look at your voting charts, it's like 50-50s, okay? It's like a swing vote with 5% margin. So if UK decided to go for hard Brexit, so and because Europe and UK is basically mirror image of one another in terms of the supply chain. So it will affect badly on all the investment coming from Asia especially you hit very bad on ASEAN countries like Vietnam, Bangladesh, because they are high in garments, mm -hmm. uh, Hong Kong especially, because mm -hmm. they're high in electronics and toys, and to a large extent, China. So I'd like you to take on this. Yeah, so of course, f first of all, is they would automatic, th there's been a lot of misinformation. I don't necessarily think it's deliberate, but we do live in a post-truth um, world where, you know, Things are, there's a lot of information and it's hard to validate if it's true or false. Um, so I think that the deal's been sold as like nothing will happen by some people, not everybody, but uh, there's um, areas of, of the electorate that believe that no tariffs will be applied in case of a hard Brexit because it's in Europe's self-interest not to apply tariffs or because they'll make an exception for the UK in view of a deal, I, I think that's not possible. So the first thing is, you're not part of the EU, the same tariffs that are applied to, to China are applied to you. It's like just that's, that's just how law works. Um, so the first impact will be that, of course, um, on the export front, anything that they're exporting to the EU will be more expensive for the EU suppliers, so these, uh, for the EU buyers. So these buyers might shift to, you know, if it costs the m cheaper from China, because now the, the same UK product has, is subject to a 25% uh, tariff, um, then they will shift suppliers to somewhere else. So the, a lot of these companies will feel the squeeze. Um, of course, the UK can choose not to impose tariffs on European imports if they're highly dependent on these European imports, such as pharmaceuticals. Um, but it is expected that a hard Brexit would trigger a cycle, uh, the depreciatory cycle of the pound, in which case it will, in any case, become more expensive for the UK to import critical medicines from, from the European market, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, they can choose not to I impose tariffs on things that, is, that they are very dependent on the EU, but just purely on, on a depreciatory front, they have, it will be more expensive for them, for them to, imp for them to import this, this sort of good. And of course, on the, on the, the auto supply chain is an, a very specific example because there's, it's so fragmented, so you'll have, um, you know, factories in Poland that are manufacturing small components that then are exported to the UK that get uh, assembled into engines that get exported to Germany and are put into cars, etc. So, of course, this supply chain is very, very, is going to be um, disrupted. And so, as a result, a lot of these companies will just have go bankrupt or will have to relocate elsewhere if they want to continue to benefit from, from that single market access and the, and the low tariffs. So, this is something that is unavoidable um, regardless of, of what happens as a result of the, the latest political shifts in the country. Any more questions? Yes, please. 
Um, I want to pick up the questions about Donald Trump and Boris Johnson. Um, yeah. I want to under, you know, understand further, you know, this kind of, uh, just how I think Dr. Shin mentioned this is outside the elite systems. Okay, so I want to understand the extent of this kind of outside the elite system coming to the, you know, political world, how it will spread out, how, you know, you know, is there a trend to other countries as well, not just US or UK? As mentioned, the overall trend is about polarization and dichotomization in the whole world. Uh, the structural reason is that in the past we, we treasure the middle ground as the communicator, like in Hong Kong. Well, like one country, two system is an elitist consensus, right? But if it's being voted, probably the outcome will be very polarized. Right now, the internet has facilitated all kind of opinions to be voiced out. In the past, they probably don't have the chance. So let's take the States, for example. A lot of uh, politically incorrect ideas are being spread, and they're impossible to be spread before the internet. I studied at Yale. The first lesson that I had was a list, a full list of politically incorrect language that we cannot touch. And right now, the internet is full of this language. So um, the internet as a vehicle has facilitated polarization, and that's point one. And secondly, algorithm. You are only able to see something that you would like to see, and that is the internet, Facebook, Instagram, Instagram Telegram, everything. So this is an analogy. Maybe originally you're only uh, slightly pro-Tory, pro-Trump, pro-Republican, but after using the internet for five years, you will be a hardcore supporter because you're only able to see the things that are supporting him. So this is the so-called impact of algorithm. As a result, we see the strengthening of the two poles and the weakening of the two in the middle. Uh, it's not only the States or Britain, as mentioned, Hong Kong witnessed the same. In the past, we respect those business leaders like the gentleman here. Uh, but right now, the younger generation in particular, they're looking for alternative leader. They don't trust anything, anyone in the middle. They would like to be their own leaders, and this is echo with the whole world. Uh, Britain is particularly unfortunate because the original system is totally made for the elites. So it's very disruptive. I think another likely outcome that we didn't have the time to touch on is the realignment of politics, realignment of parties. Right now, no matter whether you support Johnson or not, the fact is that the conservatives and the neighborhood have lost some of the original characteristics. And we see a realignment of leaders uh, be the Brexit Party is a very good example. How come it can rise so rapidly? Who are the people that support them? And what would be the interrelation between the Brexit Party and the Conservatives? According to the poll, the Tory members, they see the Brexit Party as the greatest threat, not the neighbors and not the others. So uh, I think a likely outcome will be a total realignment. And that had happened 100 years ago with the rise of labor, the decline of liberals, and it seems that we're having a similar trend here. Um, just, just to add a little point on that, um, I would like to say that, yeah, maybe as a result of globalization and how sort of profits have been shared between labor and capital or the internet, um, rise of the internet elsewhere, it's n not something that is isolated to the UK and, and the US or Western democracy. So, um, our political risk model actually captures a deterioration in countries such as China, um, Philippines, a very s big deterioration there, um, even to some extent Thailand and, and India with, uh, with a resurgence of nationalist um, Hindu sort of conservatism over there. So it's not something that's just happening in the UK and the US. Ten years ahead, do you think or do you believe UK would be better off, and but the people would be happier. <laughs> <laughs> fortune telling. We go back to the fortune telling. <laughs> yeah. Um, I I don't think that um, the UK won't survive even a hard Brexit. Um, of course, it will have implications on growth. Uh, could have the UK have had been better off in the absence of uh, this? I firmly believe that the answer is yes. Uh, will the UK survive? The answer is also yes. Will the people be happier? I'm not sure. <laughs> um, it's, it's, you're sacrificing like, the, econo the economic prospects of a whole generation. So will 
the economy will su survive, but it will not be better than it could have been in the absence of a Brexit. But this is something that even the Conservative um, debate in the UK started to pick up on. They're willing to pay the price for like that, that independence or that better political future. Um, maybe in 100 years, it, it was, you know, history will show it's the right decision, but I don't think in 20 years that the economy will be better than it could have been in the absence of a Brexit vote. That's uh, my opinion as an economist. Uh, as a political scientist, I think it's a relative concern. Whether they're happy, it depends on the comparative terms. Because a lot of things are doing badly. A lot of people, a lot of places are having their own crisis. So EU have their own crisis, uh, uh, China, the States, everywhere. But I, I, I do think, seriously, if uh, a second referendum in Scotland is coming, I, I don't think that would be good for the UK. And eventually, the Britons would regret about that, if, if that is the outcome. So that's my only answer. Yeah. You said 10 years later, right? Uh, 20. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh -huh. um, I mean, in view of the time, maybe uh, from 20 years ahead, coming back close to home, how would you see, I mean, UK being the, you know, uh, ruling Hong Kong for so many years, uh, with all the uh, anticipated problem ahead, how would you see the relationship Hong Kong-UK in the coming years? Mm -hmm. Would there be any changes or... Because the Hong Kong people tend to be kind of thinking particularly with what recently happening uh, mm. in Hong Kong, tend to oh the, the kind of the, the, the good old days in bracket, okay? Uh huh. Would you think that, that will, will 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 that give any change on that thought? It won't upload on the YouTube, right? <laughs> yes. Yes? <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. It's on the record. <laughs> um, we can carve out this part, I guess. No, I <laughs> I mean, I think history is history, right? Um, the UK had the chance to offer Hong Kong a more democratic system, and they uh -huh. didn't, um, like, way before 1997. So I think it's a little bit unfair when you have, like, very emotional uh, debates taking place right now, and people sort of yeah. say that they miss the good old days. I think yeah. it's a little bit unfair because you forget the broader, sure. the broader context. Um, but will the UK change its sort of relationship with Hong Kong as a result of ongoing negotiations, I think that would also be a little bit far-fetched. I mean, this is still a global financial center. Um, it will remain a global financial center insofar as the Chinese um, capital account is not open. Uh, China needs Hong Kong as much as Hong Kong needs China in many ways. Um, and so there are vested uh, business interests to maintain good ties with, with Hong Kong. And so I think that wouldn't change as a result. Do you know what I think? <laughs> yes. I mean, the UK will survive, but um, there will be an increase in unemployment. Um, potential growth will drop as a result. It's just the price that you want to pay for that independence. Yes. Okay. One more thing, Simon. You have anything to add on, on, on the? Oh, I was hoping to escape from that. Oh, okay. No, no. Okay. Uh, okay. Some some brief answers. Um, a few years ago, there was a plan. To um, a, a plan from Beijing, as I know, to replace some of the functions of London uh, by some of the functions in Hong Kong. Like 10 years ago, 8 years ago, the Russian president had made a visit to Hong Kong. Uh, it, it's a very important visit that people are not paying attention to. The idea is that it's possible to uh, redefine Hong Kong as a financial center serving uh, non Western interests. So at that time, there's a plan to have 500 Russian companies come to be listed here. Uh, at the end, it didn't come out. But uh, that has been a proposal. So um, why, why we mentioned that it's possible for China to be a winner. Uh, it's not entirely financial oriented. Some of the plans would try to make Hong Kong a replacement of London, and at least according to strategic design, there's such a proposal. I don't think that could be successful, but anyway, there's a such thing. Secondly, uh, I think that's not the an answer you look for. Uh, secondly, about the future of Hong Kong-UK relations, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, According to Beijing, the Joint Declaration had done its mission, blah, blah, as we all know, but uh, I, I do think there's, a, there's an option. There's a possibility that we uh, cannot rule out. That is, uh, maybe after 10 years, 20 years, uh, what would be the remaining uh, uh, interest of the British National Office's passport holders? Would they be considered seriously by the UK? And that is something that, that is worthwhile to be pondering. 
Uh, right now, we have a lot of people in Hong Kong that are having a lot of good memories of the UK, but they don't know a lot, a lot about the past. So, uh, during the Vietnam War and before that, we know a lot of other things have been happening. So, we are romanticizing the history. Uh, this is the younger generation, and I'm old enough to know some of the history. The question is, after 20 years, probably we'll have uh, a further degree of romanticization. So that is likely to be the outcome, and then it's not unreasonable to expect the UK to consider something after 10 years. Okay. In view of the time, last question. Um, by, by the way, Jennifer, you said earlier yourself that the pound was at an all-time uh, low. It actually was lower when I came to Hong Kong in the 70s. So oh, okay. it, 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 I, I wasn't. Uh, and, the big, and, the big, and the big debate, which is the point I was going to raise, was we, ju we had, this is again history, as Simon saying, uh, when we went into the EEC, the elites, as you refer to them, were very un upset about that because they threw away the Commonwealth. That upset people very, very much. But this comes to, this comes to uh, Hilton's point. So the question is, um, do you think, to what extent do you think um, the Commonwealth will now become a far more relevant factor uh, to UK and indeed internationally? There's a group of MPs which is almost moribund, but which in, since Brexit, there's now 80 of them. And this is, the, the, this is the hard Commonwealth lobby. Yeah, understood. Actually, uh, we, we, do, we do realize that there are quite a few uh, discussion in the UK about the EU, EC, referendum, etc. It's never consensus. So there are always voices about that. But what I'm personally concerned is the way of Brexit. The idea could be okay, but the entire process is extremely chaotic. It's not something that we have been teaching and learning in our whole life. Uh, a prime minister make a decision without any backup plan. Uh, that is not entirely British, in my opinion. So that is my major concern. I think that these MPs are very delusional if they think that the pull of a weekend UK can substitute the p for the pull that big countries like China are having nowadays. It's a very different context to when, when the Commonwealth was at its, at its highest peak. So I don't, I don't think that that concept, they will try, but I don't think it will, it will stick. So with that, we come to the end of uh, today's session. Thank you, Simon and Carlos, and for sharing the valuable insight about the Brexit and even beyond. And uh, from on behalf of the Chamber, I would like to thank you both and uh, for taking time out of your very busy schedule and to speak to our members today. Please join me in giving a round of applause to our distinguished speakers. Thank you, Ms. Chen, Dr. Shen, and Mr. Casanova. Please remain on stage. May I now invite General Committee Member Neville Shroff, Rural Committee Vice Chairman Rosanna Choi to come on stage for a group photo. We stay? Uh, oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining thank us you. this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, it's not a problem. I think we might have coincided at some point. Hello, Hi, I'm not sure Okay, well, we'll wait, wait and see. I mean, this, this is the logical thing to do if you don't have access.